always, or it seemed always, that the division boiled down to between the Giants and Cleveland. You know, Cleveland, New York, that was the, the big game. And we also knew they were good. Not only good, they were smart, the smartest team in football. There's a fine line between hate and respect. I used to think that I hated Paul Brown. I'm sure that he thought he hated me. The secret of it all was that they had, they had a lot of great players. And uh, so did we. HBO Sports presents Greatest Sports Rivalries. The New York Giants versus the Cleveland Browns. Hello, everybody. I'm Barry Tompkins. The show is Greatest Sports Rivalries. Football is the subject tonight. The New York football giants and the Cleveland Browns, the subject about which we're speaking. And what better person to share some thoughts with on that subject than the voice of the New York football giants for 23 years in an HBO cohort, Marty Glickman. Marty, let me ask you a little bit about this rivalry. It is interesting, I think, that nowadays you look at these two football teams and you say, rivalry? I'm not too sure. But the history really is what makes it. Well, they had a rivalry even before they took the field against each other. They were rivals because the National Football League and the New York Giants were the established organization, 25 years old, and the Cleveland Browns and the All-America Conference were the Johnny-come-latelys. And there was talk about the relative abilities of these two squads and these two leagues at that time. And, of course, the establishment pooh-poohed the rival Cleveland Browns and the All-America Conference. They weren't nearly as good, they thought, as the established National Football League. So even before they took the field, they didn't like each other very much. Well, as you mentioned, the Giants really were the perennial powerhouse. And now, all of a sudden, here's an upshot bunch of ragtag kids for all in Rags really. Ragtag? Hold it now. Don't ever call the Cleveland Browns or anything associated with Paul Brown as ragtag because he was the most meticulous coach I or anybody else ever encountered. He took care of every specific detail. He actually scouted that ball club during the war years when he coached at Great Lakes. He found Marion Motley and Max Speedy and Dante Lavelli, the great Otto Graham, Willis and Ford and all those people. He was meticulous in every detail with that team. They were not ragtag. They were first rate. Paul Brown teams also lent new meaning to the word offense. And the Giants under coach Steve Owens emphasized defense. But Paul Brown's offense was different in that where most teams complemented their running game with passing, the Browns complemented their passing game with a good run. It was also a constant about Paul Brown and his team, and that constant, I think, was criticism. The man was always under criticism, if not only from fans and from opposing players, it was from his own players and from the press. But the bottom line about Paul Brown is that he was a winner. The All-American Conference was born in 1946 as World War II ended. The Cleveland franchise was formed in the image of its head coach, a dapper man named Paul Brown. Fittingly, he called his creation the Cleveland Browns and devised a wide-open T-formation which featured sideline patterns. These routes exploited the defenses of the day, which lacked outside linebackers. During the war years, Brown had scouted and signed talent like quarterback Otto Graham from Northwestern University and a huge, graceful fullback named Marion Motley from the Great Lakes Naval Training Station. The All-American Conference was simply overrun by Brown's battalions as Cleveland won four straight league championships. Behind it all was Paul Brown, who owned the shrewdest, most active brain that had ever been bent on the simple game of football. Today, his purposeful stride still influences the game as general manager of the Cincinnati Bengals. It was something that just grew larger and larger, and, and winning begets winning. Once you're a champion, you find out how nice that is. If we had people that uh, we couldn't live with in our football, who couldn't uh, bring themselves to live within our rules or pay the price that we thought it took to win, uh, I moved them on and made no apologies for it. Brown never had to apologize for number 60. Perhaps no player better exemplified Brown's strict Midwestern ideals than Otto Grant. 
All-American boy and family man. What's more, this Jack Armstrong could play. Well, Otto Graham, and I say this and mean it sincerely, I think was the greatest quarterback of all time. I don't know of anybody I've ever known who could uh, see the entire field uh, and pick out the right guy to throw the ball to. And you name me some other quarterback that took his team into 11 championships. He was an All-American basketball player, played in the Pro League for a while. And uh, as a golfer, tremendous. He's near a scratch, uh, even today, after having a bout with cancer. Otto Graham won his bout with cancer in New London, Connecticut, where he is ranking captain and athletic director at the United States Coast Guard Academy. I think the prime factor in our winning was Paul Brown because he would start off every year and say to us, you were champions last year, that doesn't mean a darn thing. So every year we'd start off and he would say, we have to go through everything from the very beginning again. And we would sit there and he would dictate and we'd write these things down, you know, and it got a little tiresome writing down how to run, how to do calisthenics and this type of thing. But we did it every doggone year. If anybody had any tendency to come, become a little bit fat-headed and, uh, you know, and as he says, ripe, uh, he took it out of us in a hurry. He did not allow prima donnas on his football team. All the prima donnas resided in the NFL on teams like the New York Giants under head coach Steve Owens. The Giants were Steve Owens, the coach, and Steve was no jolly fat man. But Steve had a different uh, offense than anybody else. His offense was the A formation. New York's A formation reflected the plotting nature of NFL offenses during this period. But in 1948, the Giants signed number 42, Charlie Connolly. Connolly had been an All-American tailback in Mississippi, and his arm pumped life into the old A formation. Connolly had gray in his hair even then. Today, at the age of 59, Connolly lives in Clarksdale, Mississippi, where he owns a shoe store and remembers his role as perennial giant veteran. When I first came with the Giants, I, I guess they listed me as 24 years old, but I was 27 because I'd been in college and I went in World War II for three years. My offensive players, uh, linemen, the guys who were blocking for me kind of felt sorry for me because I was a little older. When the you know, guards, say for example, it missed a block, some of my teammates would come back and apologize, where I would tell them, you're killing me, you're hurting me, and, uh, and I think my age uh, helped me <laughs> quite a bit with them. So while Charlie was working on his A, Otto was brushing up his T. The two would not meet until Cleveland joined the NFL in 1950. Well, while the Giants and their A formation were winning everything in the NFL, the All-American Conference was simply no contest. And I guess, Marty, really, it was only a matter of time until the National Football League just had to say to the Cleveland Browns and, in fact, to two other teams in the All-American Conference, OK, come on in. But the Browns had a little test waiting. I mean, the first game they played in the National Football League was tough. Tough. It was against the Philadelphia Eagles, the National Football League champions, and Commissioner Burt Bell wanted to really test those Browns against Steve Van Buren and Bosch Pritchard and a marvelous Philadelphia Eagle team. And the Eagles were really walloped in that ball game. I think the final was 35 to 10 or something like that. The Browns came in a hurry. They didn't arrive, they were there. Well, the Browns, of course, as we mentioned, all offense. And all of a sudden, I guess, the experienced people in the NFL and the establishment just kind of had to sit up and take notice. They sure did. And particular notice was taken by the New York Giants. So it didn't take too long for the Cleveland Browns to bounce into the National Football League, and all of a sudden, the establishment was believers. New York City's lunch hour crush swirls around Ali Sherman, once head coach of the Giants, now a television executive. Sherman looks back to 1950, when as a giant assistant, he scouted Cleveland in its first NFL game against the Philadelphia Eagles. The first time I ever scouted the Browns, I realized after the first 20 plays, this is the first time I'd ever seen this happen, uh, here's a ball club who had run 20 plays, and 15 of those plays, they threw the ball on 15 plays. Remarkable. 
The Eagles use man-to-man -man coverage. There's no way they're going to be able to stay with Lavelli and Speedy and Jones and Graham throwing that ball. They just took the Eagles out of it, totally. Cleveland won 35 to 10 and left a lasting impression. These babies could throw the ball, these babies could play defense, and they were football players and, a, and a one heck of a football team. By the time Cleveland and New York met in the season's third week, a plan to neutralize Graham's passing attack had been devised. The Giants swarmed all over the Browns, led by number 49, defensive back Tom Landry. Cleveland's sideline patterns had never been shut off so effectively. But we came up with what got to be known as the umbrella defense. As soon as Graham got the ball from center and showed pass, Ray Poole and Jim Duncan, they were defensive ends and never played linebacker in their lives, but they were drilled to drop eight yards at 45 degree angles. In fact, actually what they became were the first linebackers in what became a 4-3-4 four, four that way. And that was the start of this great rivalry. The umbrella dealt Paul Brown his only two losses that first NFL season, setting up a playoff in frigid Cleveland for the Eastern Division title. This time, Graham went to crossing patterns underneath the umbrella. Meanwhile, the Cleveland defense stopped Charlie Connolly cold as the Browns beat New York 8-3 and moved on to the NFL championship against the Los Angeles Rams. Rosa will attempt a field goal. It'll be 15 yards. He boots the ball. It's up in the air. It's gone! It's gone! It's gone! The outsiders from the lesser league were now champions of the world. Throughout the glory years of the early 50s, the magic touch of the Brownies transformed all those who wore the uniform. Paul Brown's system turned out 40 future NFL coaches, including number 65, Chuck Noll. Also matriculating were Walt Michaels, Mike McCormick, Don Shula, and fun-loving Abe Gibron. Abe Gibron is the type of person that everybody should have on their team. He's the kind of guy who keeps you loose. He wasn't quite as big then as he is now. He's Lebanese, of course, and we go to training camp, and all night long, Abe would play those Lebanese records, you know, the Arab records, we used to call them, you know, all these dance musics, and, and we would all scream, Abe, shut that doggone thing off, you know, and uh, you go down to his room, and he'd be in there dancing away, fooling around, you know, you're fully expecting to see a snake pop out of a box or a cobra or something with his head flashing back and forth. We had a great time, though, really. A guy like that is a must for any football team. Abe lives near Tampa, Florida, where as defensive coordinator for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, his sense of humor remains intact. It was a togetherness, a family with the Browns, and the, these are things that you miss. You know, one guy was in trouble, everybody was in trouble. A, a guy got in a, a fight with a, in a tavern, and that next night there was uh, 50 Browns down there. Uh, it's, it was like a family. Uh, today it's big business, and it's not that togetherness like it was, but... We dominated the league, you know, we won 10, 11 in a row every year for five or six years. And that's why the rivalry with the Giants was so great. They're the only team that would, they'd ever beat us, and everybody couldn't figure out why. Paul Brown actually uh, built up that rivalry more than anybody else because Paul honestly did not like New York City. Paul Brown, I think, is a small town boy at heart. Whenever he went to New York, he wanted to get out as quickly as possible, with a victory, of course. We, we became the special object of the New York people and the media helped do it uh, it was during those days that uh, i became the <laughs> the cold deadly brutal you know all that image thing that uh, went with it brown's image was just grand for box office as the mid-50s brought a change of tempo to pro football New York was out of the A and into Charlie Connolly hooking up with number 16, Frank Gifford. Gifford was a California boy whose versatility gave Cleveland fits. The Browns' trump card was still ageless Otto Graham, now wearing number 14, but up to the same old tricks. In 1955, after leading his team into their 10th straight championship game, Otto said it was good and retire. 
So Otto Graham was gone. Paul Brown says he's the greatest. Marty, what do you think? He was certainly among the greatest. The finest pure passer I ever saw was Sammy Baugh of the Washington Redskins, and perhaps alongside of him, Y.A. Tittle. But ranking right with them as a great all-round quarterback, because he certainly could carry the ball as well, was Otto Graham. Well, of course, with the absence of Otto Graham, everybody had to make adjustments, and I think the Giants really made many more than did the Browns. They picked up a couple of assistant coaches you might have heard of. Uh, Lombardi, I think, was one of them, and Landry was another one. Vince Lombardi and Tom Landry, two of the greatest who ever coached the game. And Tom Landry changed the concept of defensive play. Time was that the defensive end had his piece of territory, the defensive tackle his piece of territory, and so on. He changed those individual responsibilities to team responsibilities, and he built his defense around the middle linebacker. And the Giants had a really good middle linebacker, a fellow named Sam Huff. He was something. Really wasn't a bad player, and so it was the job of that man right there to stop that man right there. It wasn't easy. Frank Gifford is a television celebrity living in Greenwich, Connecticut, but at heart, he'll always be an old giant. When we got here, there was an intense rivalry at the time between the Giants and Paul Brown. They played these games like six to nothing, and uh, the Giants had, had nothing but defense. Then Vince Lombardi came in in 54 and started to put things together offensively. Lombardi realized that he had this sort of special group of guys that when your deep pass pattern man is uh, Frank Gifford, you got a problem because uh, I didn't need a coffee break to cover 50 yards. Uh, Webster was our next fastest back, I guess, and this is really funny. Uh, but we beat a lot of people with a lot of slow receivers. Lombardi devised an offense geared to the special skills of his special men, a plan which required precise timing and teamwork. Lombardi's influence was unmistakable, just as it would be in Green Bay during the 60s. Lombardi's defensive counterpart was former giant player Tom Landry. Landry's innovative defense required an anchor in the middle, and he chose a youngster named Sam Huff from West Virginia. Huff captured the imagination of New York fans as middle linebacker in Landry's 4-3 defense. It was a position designed for aggression. Smiling Sam Huff was transformed into a menacing villain. Today, the echo of these violent days is fading, and mild-mannered Sam Huff is an executive with the Marriott Corporation in Bethesda, Maryland. And the 4-3 defense was just being developed by Tom Landry. Fortunately, I lived in the same hotel in New York that Tom Landry lived in, and he would call me down every night and talk to me about playing linebacker, going over defenses with me. So I was really tutored almost 24 hours a day by Tom Landry. And it was developed around me, and we coordinated all 11 players on defense. While Landry built his defense on the practice field, Paul Brown turned to his scouts in the draft to offset the loss of Otto Graham. Greet some boys who might help next year. Bill Plum is at left, Jim Brown in the center. Brown is the Syracuse All-American, the first round choice. And when we drafted him, I, I thought he was going to be a great back. It turns out that, for my money, he's the greatest running back of all time. Jim Brown injected some soul into the NFL. He was a man whose action footage speaks louder than words. NFL seasons. Jim Brown never missed a game while gaining more yards and scoring more touchdowns than any other back in history. Today, Jim Brown lives in Beverly Hills, California. He makes his living as an actor, although he looks like he still has a few 100-yard games left in him. Well, I was very happy to play for Paul Brown because Paul was very strict. He was the king. 
Well, there wasn't anyone that, in, that counted other than Paul. In other words, he ran a very efficient organization. There weren't any cliques. Uh, racism didn't really play a part in it. Uh, all you had to do was deal with him. If you dealt with him successfully, uh, then you were all right. You didn't have to worry about the other guys. We'd try to use Jim Brown all we could because, uh, well, as we used to say, why shoot a pop gun when you got a cannon? The rivalry then developed between, uh, at least on the, the New York media's part, between <laughs> Sam Huff and Jim Brown. This thing sort of developed about Sam was keying on Jim Brown. Well, when you played the Browns, you had to key on Jim Brown. We had Andy Robustelli and Greer and Modulesky and everyone back there keying on Jim Brown. They played a team defense based on a concept that they developed. And when they came up against the Browns, they knew I was going to carry the ball a certain amount of times. So they studied my stance, where I would lean on certain plays. They would call out numbers. <laughs> and yet we would manage to beat them a few times, you know. So <laughs> it was a good rivalry. While the Browns, Jim and Paul, won their share of skirmishes, by 1957, the battle had begun to swing toward the giant defense. Still, it was always a struggle. Dick Nolan, who was our defensive safety, little guy, Nolan, we used to call him Sticks. He, he didn't weigh 180 pounds. He came up and really hit Jim Brown head on and got him. It was some shot. <laughs> and I came over and I picked Nolan up. <laughs> And I said, hey, Dick, I'm sorry I didn't get there in time, you know, I, you know, but great tackle. You really got him, you know, and he says, great tackle. Hell, he says, I couldn't get out of his way. <laughs> Stories about Jimmy Brown, of course, are legend. It's interesting. I think you could look at the statistics of Jim Brown and say the guy was a great athlete. But there's really no telling exactly how great an athlete the man was. He may have been the finest lacrosse player who ever lived. Imagine giving a guy like Jimmy Brown a 6'3 and 235 pounds a stick. <laughs> And he was a fine basketball player. He played varsity basketball at Syracuse University as well. He could do most anything. And on the football field, he was the greatest runner, as Paul Brown has said, who ever played the game. And I think that's almost a universal feeling, too. 1958, the rivalry between the two teams maybe was as intense as ever. Absolutely. And I think because every game was critical. And the personalities on the two ball clubs were also so outstanding, so aggressive, and so warmly felt by the fans in both cities. After all, that giant squad with Modulewski and Greer and Huff and Patton, as well as the offensive players like Alex Webster and Frank Gifford and Kyle Rote and Charlie Connolly, the personalities of those ball players lent themselves to the rivalry as well. The Giants essentially were a conservative football team, and yet in the final game, it came down to razzle-dazzle. And what better man to do that kind of play than Frank Gifford? In 1958, the Giants and Browns played in the final regular season game. Cleveland needed a win to advance to the NFL championship against Baltimore. With a score tied at 10, Pat Summerall kicked an unforgettable field goal to win the game and force a playoff for the Eastern Division title. Pat Summerall kicked the greatest field goal that I've ever seen, and he, I think he got credit for a 49-yard field goal. I don't know how they could even measure it because we had so much snow. It actually took a big sachet to the left and went over. Made it. And, of course, then we have to come back the following week to play again. In the playoff, another fateful play occurred. A reverse to Frank Gifford ended up back in the hands of Charlie Connolly, who scored the game's only touchdown. Webster took the ball on a 28. I came back from my flanker, short flanker spot, and I was hoping against hope that whoever this defensive end was would do what he had been doing in the movies, that is Chase Webster, because if he didn't and came up field, uh, I might have been in semi-retirement. Webster gave me the ball, and sure enough, he went whistling by me, uh, and I caught somebody out of the corner of my eye, and it was uh, Charlie. And so I just turned around and flipped it to Charlie, who was uh, about 38 at the time, and. Uh, he was shocked <laughs> that he had the football. And I was just uh, hanging around out there, and uh, he threw the ball to me. I was surprised as much as the 70,000 people in the stands to get the ball. And I ran it over, uh, nothing, no speed or nothing. And uh, 42 for Cleveland, same as my number. He tacked me right on the goal line, and he said some unkind word for you, lucky old man or something. And after that, I told Frank, once I give you the ball, please don't give it back to me. 
That was the only touchdown uh, we scored that day, but uh, we beat them 10 to nothing. Cleveland was left behind as the Giants went on to play the most memorable game in NFL history. Baltimore's sudden death victory over New York signaled the beginning of a new age for pro football. The television boom spread a network of coaxial cables from the stadiums to every living room in America, and nothing was ever the same. The teams still played, but the rivalry was dying. Well, there will be rivalries that generate in pro football as long as pro football is played. I don't think they'll ever be as intense or maybe as dramatic as the Cleveland Brown New York Giant rivalry. Well, I think that period was much more enjoyable for the players. I feel sorry for some of the players today with the pressures that they have and the pressures they put on themselves. Uh, the tremendous amounts of monies involved, I think, quite frankly, in many cases, uh, dictate whether a player is going to go out and play. Uh, he's running on uh, quarter of a million dollar knees, and we were running on two bit knees. I played because I liked to play. Uh, didn't make any money, really. I made a lot of friends in uh, football who I still see. And, uh, and we reminisce about the good years, uh, which we had some. My life, my love, my loyalty, my family was a New York Giants. But the camaraderie was there. I enjoyed it. It stimulated me, and uh, I think it was one of the reasons that I was able to play nine years without missing a game. <laughs> but I respect and am proud of them. If any rivalry is only as good as the men who give it heart and soul, then this must have been one of the very best. Marty, what made this rivalry so special? Can it ever exist in the form that it had again? It was special because of a combination of things, Barry. There were only 12 teams in the National Football League, and consequently, we knew more about the personalities of the makeup of those 12 teams. And the Giants in those days, and the Browns, were always Giants, and always Browns. We think of Jimmy Brown, or Otto Graham, or Marion Motley, or Max Speedy, Dante Lavelli now, and we think of them as Browns. And we think of Kyle Rote or Alex Webster or Frank Gifford, Chuck Connolly, they're giants. They were always giants. Even though a fellow like Sam Huff may have finished his career with the Washington Redskins, he still thinks of himself, as he said, as a New York giant. There was a loyalty, an association, an affiliation, a warmth for the ball club and the organization. I'm not sure it exists today. The Cleveland Browns and the New York Giants, one of sports' greatest rivalries. For Marty Glickman, then, I'm Barry Tompkins. Thanks for joining us this time. And we'll see you next time on Greatest Sports Rivalries. Life, so they say, this brother came and they let it slip away. No, like the autumn sun should be dying, but it's only just begun. Like the twilight in the road up ahead They don't see just where we're going Don't